Fab. So I'm ready to go now, yeah? Yes. Brilliant. Okay. So as I was saying, uh, thank you all for coming on this glorious evening. I hope I'm not keeping everyone out from the last afternoon and evening sun. Um, as Lisa was saying, this is seminar, this webinar is based on the book that Karen and I wrote um, and we'll talk a little bit more about the, the help series that's out and about. Um, to give you a little bit of information about uh, me, just trying to get my screen to change, for some reason it's not going to the next one. Uh, hang on, we're just having a slight technical issue, for some reason this is locked. Hmm, this could be a little interesting. Aha, here we go. So, um, as Lisa was saying, I've, I've worked with dogs and wolves. I've worked with dogs for 28 years now um, and uh, started in Guide Dogs for the Blind and then I became a Talent in Touch practitioner back in the late 90s. was one of the very first people to qualify in the UK um, and I've been working basically since 2000 as a T-Touch practitioner. Um, I'm also now a real dog yoga instructor as well. Started writing books um, just as I uh, left the, the UK Wolf Conservation Trust and uh, interestingly writing this book, um, this picture here is of my dog Mr P and he was a fairly new addition to the, to the family, he's just walked in the room, hi Mr P, um, when Karen and I started writing this book and he actually had travelling issues so I was kind of writing stuff uh, along with dealing with him so I've really kind of practiced what I've preached uh, in the book and I can tell you that it definitely did work. So let's have a look at reasons why your dog might be a bad traveller um, because let's define it because it will mean different things to different people. Lots of people will think it's because their dog is motion sickness and it is a big big issue obviously motion sickness in dogs um, but there may be a, a general anxiety about being in the car for whatever reason it could be there's a bad association, um, they've been dumped from a car, they've uh, had um, been in an accident or something like this. Some dogs will jump around in cars and might be reactive, uh, for example, to movement around them or they just can't settle because they just can't balance in it. Other dogs are going to be really vocal. And you will also get occasionally dogs who just won't get in the car at all, which obviously then is a massive trouble, especially if you've got a big dog lifting them in and out, um, could be serious injuries for you too. So there's lots of reasons why dogs would be a bad traveller. Um, so we'll we'll cover some of these in the in the talk. We'll probably sort of focus a little bit more on motion sickness because that tends to be the, the one that you get um, asked for help with the most. However, in the book, just to let you know, we cover all of those angles and all training aspects for all of these as well. So have a look at some of the signs. So obviously some of these are going to be really, really um, obvious uh, and it's a confusing slide because it's a bit of a confusing subject really. So I thought I'd put lots of things up there so you can have a little whiz through and read through them yourself. Um, but I think for some people they might not really pick up those minor start of the dogs being a little bit anxious. Things like yawning, things like being a bit restless and constantly changing position. You wouldn't normally put down to maybe a dog starting to have a problem in the car. But if we can recognize all of these signs at a very low level when the dogs are just starting to tell us that they're not comfortable, we can start working with them then so it doesn't go into being a major problem. Now I know for some people who maybe have a rescue dog and, and they've already have big issues in the car, you know, you, the dogs are going to already be vomiting or or drooling or having diarrhea or you know having those big extremes of of travel um, problems, none of which are going to be pleasant for you or the dog to be. But I, I want you to really think about those tiny little signs as well because you can help your dog then and stop them becoming a, a major issue later on. Some of the common mistakes people make about car travelling as well, it's like puppy's first journey, you know, people spend hours researching breeders, making sure they have a breeder that, you know, does all the right socialisation and it may be that it's someone quite a few hours drive away from you and then they totally forget that that puppy's first journey is a massive deal for them. Not only have they been whipped away from everything they are familiar with, they're now in something that's probably going to make them feel a little bit sick. They may be isolated in a box somewhere that isn't anywhere near anybody they know. Um, it's a long time, they may miss a feed, you know, there's lots of things that can be really traumatic for them. 
So if you're going to do puppy's first journey, make sure that the puppy is in contact with you all time, either in a box on your lap or on your lap if it's safe to do so. Make sure they've had a little play around and they've relieved themselves that they're quite sleepy. Um, you can do some of the tea touch ear work. We'll talk about tea touch later if you don't know what that is. Um, and make it a pleasant journey, lots of stops. You know, have some ventilation through the through the car, obviously not too much because at this age they can't regulate their temperature so well. And it kind of goes to say as well, if you've got a rescue dog, their first journey is really important. So when Mr. P came home with us, and although the only journey was only about 20 minutes away from the rescue centre he came from, I made sure I was in the back of the car with him, that I continued to do um, ear work and other calming things with him um, because it's really unsettling. Another common mistake or uh, assumption that some people make is that the dogs will just grow out of it because of course most puppies are going to be a little bit car sick and a little bit worried in the car to begin with. And yes, some do grow out of it, but they don't all grow out of it. So even if you've got a puppy and you think, oh well, don't worry, a few months time we'll be fine, get in and do some work, you know, take some of the tips from this webinar and it will be really helpful. Read those early signs, as I was saying, you know, you know, if they're, if they're panting, if they're holding their breath, if they're frozen in the car, if they're starting to yawn or lick their lips a lot or, you know, look away from you, doing all these kind of subtle signals that they're not very happy. One of the biggest things I have with clients as well is that they push the training too quickly when they're doing car training. So instead of just doing two to five minutes, they will go, okay, my dog was okay going around the block, so I'll go for a six mile drive. It's too much. You know, I was liken it to saying, you know, you need to go from your front doorstep to your front gate, not from your front doorstep to the moon. Take it in tiny steps. And it may seem to you like it's taking a long time, but actually it will take very little time at all and it will build the dog's up confidence up quickly. Don't get annoyed with them, you know, we get annoyed and frustrated, not necessarily at them, but just because we're upset for them and they will pick up on that. So keep as calm as you can. And remember about those bad associations, puppies first couple of trips in the car when you've got them home might be to the vets to have really scary vaccinations. So make sure they set up those good associations right from the beginning. Uh, but, oops. We've just got a, okay, here we go, position or restraint in the car. So we'll talk about that a little bit later as well. But often that can make a huge difference to where the dogs are positioned in the car and how you kind of um, have them safely um, restrained, whether that's a harness or a crate or whatever. The biggest thing I can say to you, though, is just don't try doing one thing at a time. So lots of people say to me, well, I tried a Daptal, that didn't work. I tried a Thunder shirt, that didn't work. I tried this, I tried that. But if you put them all together and use them at the same time, it's going to be much more powerful, much more likely to work because all these things will have a good effect um, and a little effect. But put them together, they're going to be stronger and they're going to be more effective. So. Yes, I can definitely say a large proportion of travellers can be helped, uh, but sometimes it is about turning detective. There are, might be that you don't know why they have an issue jumping in the car or, you know, why they get really worried if you go on some roads and not others. So it's a case of sometimes really kind of working through a list of what you think might be the issue to see whether you can actually find out what that problem is. So don't be frightened to turn detective and really, really analyse this. Because I can say that the biggest causes that we found for dogs with car issues are health issues, so pain-related issues, for example, whether it's arthritis or whether it's you know, something like panosteitis or um, ear problems, etc. It could be a balance issue. This is another really big cause of, of problems. And of course, puppies and young dogs are constantly out of balance because they, they're growing all the time. They have to figure out how to use their bodies on a flat, non-moving surface. Put them in the car and it's twice as worse. And the other, the, one of the big three, I would say, is dig digestive issues. So we find a lot of dogs who need um, a dietary change or maybe just need some probiotics because their diet, they, you know, their stomachs just aren't settled enough. There's something going on in the digestive um, issues that causes big problems in the car as well. So looking at the other ones that we have, um, comfort is a big one. So, you know, does the bed slip around when you go around corners? Um, can they face forwards? Uh, you know, are they happy in the back of the car? Look at all these issues because comfort can be a really big thing for them. 
It may just be that they're just also really sensitive. So if you have a dog that's got noise phobia anyway, putting them in a car that's got sensors going off, got windstream wipers going off, there's heavy rain bouncing off the roof, or the, the wheels make a sound at a particular speed on the motorway, or the wind going through the, um, the uh, roof rails, for example, can cause big issues for them. So look at all those stress factors. What is it that might be stressing your dog out? Um, you know, is it a bad association? For example, years ago, I had a dog that um, traveled really well, except when it was raining really hard. And that's because I'd had to do an emergency stop one day and he'd been thrown off the back seat. Um, and from that day forward, rainy, uh, rain and cars were dangerous. Fine any other time of the day or, and any other kind of weather situation, but not when it was raining. Could it be the car that's causing the problem? So there is some evidence or some likelihood that static electricity could be an issue for some dogs, you know, getting electric shot as, shot as they get in the car or touching bedding, et cetera, et cetera. Um, there is argument about whether earthing strips help this, but they're really quite inexpensive and easy to fit. You can get them from any kind of car shop. So popping one of those on the car might be useful. Uh, like I say, maybe those sensors, those those wheels going around, the different uh, sounds could be really interesting for them. So see whether you know changing some of these or driving at a different speed or something can help with that. Cars are also so well built these days that the pressure when you close the door, if you don't crack the window open, can be really quite alarming for some dogs and probably painful for some that have got real hearing sensitivity. So just make sure when you're closing doors that you do it gently or you've cracked a window to see whether that's the issue and whether that's why they're a little reluctant or a little bit scared of the car. Another car's suspensions can be really, really difficult. They can be too hard or too soft and it just means the dogs don't have a comfortable ride. And it's also about that, that length as well. You know, if you've got them in the boot and you've got an estate car, it's a bigger swing as you're going around corners. They can get thrown around quite a lot, especially the little dogs. Stupid things like air fresheners. You know, we think about, I, I can't have an air freshener in the car. It's just too powerful for me. And my nose is nowhere near as good as a dog's nose. So remove anything that's going to be over-scented, you know, really, really smelling the car that could affect the dogs. And weirdly, some dogs really, really get concerned about your eyes in the mirror. So if the dogs are looking really concerned and you're kind of constantly checking out them and look in the mirror, um, that disembodied eyes can be a really big problem for some dogs. So just changing the angle slightly of that mirror can really help for some of them. So let's talk about traveling position. So like I say, for some dogs being right in the back of the car is is not the right place for them. The swing of the car is too much. Um, the movement may be too difficult. If it's a small boot, like you've got a hatchback, they haven't got enough room to, to be in the right position. So like a lot of humans, dogs will often feel worse if they're, for example, motion sick, if they're not facing forward or back. So think about that if you've got them on the back seat or in a narrow boot and they can't, they have to go sideways, that can be a, a big problem. But of course, cars just aren't designed for hum for dogs at all. They're designed for humans. So for example, you know, my dog's huge and he likes to travel on the back seat. This is actually the back seat of my car. So I've, I've rigged up a hammock seat. Um, I've put stuffing, I've stuffed things in the, the space between my seat and, and the uh, rear seat so he doesn't fall down the gap. You know, we've made it to it's as comfortable as possible because he does like to look forward and he's now got a way that he can lay and actually do that or he'll sit and actually be able to face forwards. So really think about where they are in the car because that will make a huge effect. Even the placement of the crate and if it's, you know, if, if you have that choice, have it more in the middle of the car and you're able to secure it as well so obviously it doesn't move around, um, it can be really um, useful for them to not feel such big movement as you're turning corners, going round and roundabouts, etc. So really think about it. And of course, if you have a dog with separation anxiety, like my boy has, being in the boot is far too far away from me. Cars are sc were scary things anyway to begin with. So for him, back seat was much more uh, acceptable. He's closer to us. Um, we can contain him on the back seat. He's happier there um, and he doesn't panic because he's not too far away from us. You also need to look at yourself and your driving. Here's my friend Graham here driving tractor. He's looking very happy and relaxed. He's a very happy, relaxed person. But you know what it's like. We're busy. We're um, anxious about our dogs. Somebody pulls out in front of us um, and we're before we know it, we're shouting and swearing and waving our arms around. 
just going to wind your dog up. So be as calm as you can. Also look at your own driving. It's really interesting, even just slowing up a little gradually uh, uh, than you would normally do as you get to a roundabout can make a huge difference because often it's the stop start and it's the abrupt starts that makes them feel really, really sick. So just making sure that you're very smooth in your takeoff and your stops can be really different. Um, for example, with Mr. P, you know, also he was a lot different when I was driving the car to when my partner drives the car. So when Pete drives he, to begin with, he would often be sick because he just wouldn't kind of just do as smooth a turns around roundabouts, for example, like that than I would. But look at your own emotions as well, because that will really help if you're calm and collected. So motion sickness. Um, obviously often associated with puppies, you know, they're growing all the time, the inner ear hasn't developed properly, um, everything is uh, constantly going in and out of balance for them. So that can often cause that issue for them. But with older dogs, you know, vestibular, you know, ear problems, um, whether it's inner ear or middle ear, um, it could be digestive issues have said before or it just the sickness might just come from absolute sort of tension and fear if they're holding tension through their bellies you know it can obviously make them feel sicker as well so just doing simple things like like the positioning in the car like just cracking a window open so some air coming through can be really really helpful for them so of course thinking about drugs that you can give to dogs um, and I'm not a great fan of going straight to these, and we're going to look at some of the reasons why these might not be as so effective at the moment, but it is an option for some people, especially if it's an extreme problem. Um, and for some people, um, it might work. It's not a fix, um, and it's certainly not something you should be using long term, but for any emergencies or for when you're doing training, um, sometimes things like the anti-sickness tablets can help or the over-counter calming products. So you just go into your search engine and just, go, you know, just type in, you know, um, calming products for, or for dogs traveling or, you know, anti-sickness um, products for dogs who are bad travelers, and you'll find loads of them. Um, again, some of them are, can be effective, some of them aren't, um, so you have to find the right one for you. Now, the difference between tranquilizers and, sed and sedation. So tranquilizers are going to help the dogs just to stay really nice and calm, but it's going to keep them alert as well, so active, and um, their brains are going to be fully functioning. Where sedation is more, you're going to knock them out more, they will have a state of calm, but that brain is really turned off, they often will then fall asleep if they don't fight it because they're so frightened, um, and it also has some sort of pain relief as well, so you often obviously use sedation if you're going to be doing you know, stitches if they've had a minor um, you know, injury or something like that. So that, that's the difference between tranquilizers and sedation. Obviously, you don't really want to be using sedation if you're going to get to the end of your journey and, and you want your dog to have fun uh, because they're going to be really, really dopey. So maybe if you need to do traveling um, before you've managed to do all of these, uh, these things that I'm going to suggest, then tranquilizers um, through your vet's advice may be useful one or two times if you absolutely have to. The problem with veterinary drugs, though, is that it's really difficult to get the timing right. Lots of them need to be given either with food or without food, half an hour before, an hour before tra traveling. They last for this many hours and you have to redose. When, by the time you work out, the actual window you have for traveling is tiny. You know, it's really difficult. They also can have some massive side effects. And funny enough, some of the side effects can be things like vomiting and diarrhea, <laughs> which is what you're trying to obviously avoid. Um, when I was when I was researching for the book, uh, I was researching about all the meds, and I spent two days putting a list of all of the side effects together for some of the popular drugs that people used, um, veterinary drugs. Um, and in the end, we decided we couldn't really put them all in the book because we'd probably get lawyers on our back. Um, so, if you're on certain medications, you can't be used. If there are certain ages, they can't be used. They can't. Some of them can't be used long term. So there are a lot of problems. Plus, added to that, obviously, you've got massive cost implications as well. So can be helpful if it's an extreme case, like I say, and if you need to travel. Otherwise, I, I'm hoping that you'll by the end of this webinar, you'll have lots of other solutions that you're and, and things that you can try. 
So let's look at some of those. Let's look at the holistic options. So um, some of you might be familiar uh, with some or all of these um, who attended today, but some of you may not. Um, so let's look at homeopathy, really safe thing to use. Um, but there are obviously masses and masses of different um, remedies out there. And there's quite a long list that you can use for dogs who are travel sickness. And it would depend on what their symptoms are. So, for example, there's uh, petroleum, um, and this is really good for dogs that are nauseous and might do belching and drooling along with that as well. And they often do better when the air's warm, um, and they're worse when it's damp. Uh, and you can go through the whole list and kind of just read out, you know, you know, all of these um, symptoms that are going to be better for them. So it's quite confusing. Uh, and also how often to give, when to give, all these things, you know, you need to have a little bit of knowledge about it, but they can be really, really useful. So with any of these, my suggestion would be is to get hold of a, um, a qualified homeopathic vet, and there are numerous ones, good ones out there, uh, and they'll be able to take a whole history for your dog and be able to come up with the correct one. Often they need what we call a constitutional remedy that goes along with some of the remedies that they might um, prescribe for the travel sickness. Um, and that constitutional remedy is like their personality remedy. It's the one they need to help everything else work as it were. So it can be quite complicated, but it is also quite safe to use some of them, most of them without, you know, but you do obviously have to be um, a little bit careful if, you're, if your dog is on drugs for something else. So this is where checking with your vets is really, really important. But generally, though, they're very safe to use, but it might be if you pick the wrong one, it won't work. So you'll think, well, homeopathy isn't working for me, but it may just be you haven't got the right remedy. It's the same with the essential oils, really. And essential oils, I would say, are a little bit more um, specialised than the homeopathy. Specialised is the wrong kind of word, I think, but probably a little bit more involved. You know, we need to really know what we're talking about when we're using um, aromatherapies and, and this, that and the other. So one of the, the main ones that you might think about using um, if your dog is motion sick, for example, would obviously be ginger. And lots of people swear by giving their dogs ginger tablets or ginger biscuits. But we do have to be a little bit careful with these things because actually ginger can make dogs again vomit uh, and be quite sickly if you give the wrong um, amount. So for me, what I used with my boy was actually a floral water, a ginger floral water. So it's the essence really diluted. I could just spray it in the car so it's not even on him or in him. Uh, and the smell of the ginger could often just take that, that sense of nausea down and kind of get him through that journey training without being sick for him. So it was really useful. This is actually a picture of him here with his nose in some German chamomile, which is another really calming one if your dog's really anxious. But each dog is going to be different. So what happens with essential oils is the dog self-selects. So you offer lots of uh, remedies of what you think they might need. Some of them they'll turn their nose up at. And other ones, like here with Mr. P, he's got his nose in the bottle. This isn't us putting the bottle right up to him. We actually started with a couple of feet away and he moved towards the bottle because he really liked that smell. And he actually just kind of sniffed it for about an hour and a half. So when you get the right one, you really know. And you can then use that in your pre-training or you can then go on and use it um, actually in the car as well. But again, lots of really brilliant practitioners out there. Um, and you can message me after if you want to find one and I'll, I'll, we'll send you in the right directions for that. Lots of you probably hear the flower essences. Uh, and of course, the, the one that most people heard about is Rescue Remedy. Got five different remedies in there that may be useful if your dog is like really panicked about the car. But if they're not really panicked, but they're just a bit anxious, it may be that they could do with a little bit of Mimulus. And Mimulus is really good for sort of fear of known things. If they're not very good with the movement of the car, Walnut can be really good. And these flower essences, you can buy them from any um, uh, uh, health food stores. Again, they're very, very safe. They're easy to um, to give the dogs. Um, they have, as far as we know, we've never heard of any dogs having any side effects from them. Um, and there's lots of information online as well. You can look and you can pick out the ones you think your dog needs the most. And you could make up a bottle with them um, and give them regularly and that might really help. 
One of the interesting things we've done in the book is put lots of acupressure points in. So lots of people will swear by these acupressure bands that you can use, that they go on a certain acupressure point on your wrist for humans. And actually, um, one of the points we use on dogs is to stay at that same point, um, and it's just above their wrist, as it were. Um, and some of the, in the book, what we've done is listed out ones that are really good for motion sickness. So things like um, some of the uh, gastric points, some of the pericardium points, um, and then also listed ones that are really good for dogs that are just anxious in the car as well, like the heart points and the Kevin's gate, etc. Now, these acupressure points are just areas on the body that if you stimulate them, it just helps balance um, their bodies out. So it can be really good to help them make them feel better, get all their energies flowing properly through the body. Um, and again, a little bit of knowledge can be a little bit of a dangerous thing. So what we suggest in the book is that instead of actually stimulating the acupressure points by pushing on them, is that you just do some of the Tellington Touch body work around the area you think they are. Because some of them, are they're, they're obviously the points are quite precise and you may find trouble finding them if you're not sure anyway. But again, loads of good practitioners out there um, and uh, finding one can be really helpful or finding a vet that does acupuncture as well because obviously only vets can do acupuncture. <clears throat> Herbal remedies, um, just because they're natural doesn't automatically mean they're safe and I would suggest if you're going to use herbal remedies that again you chat to a vet. Um, we did, when we were writing the book, look up and have lots of people suggest that you um, made some teas up for your dogs, so chamomile tea and peppermint tea, and these are going to be really safe. Um, you know, you can offer them to the dogs and they can either drink them or not drink them. They're not going to drink them if they don't need them or don't want them, but to settle the stomach after um, traveling, sometimes some of the dogs really will take some of these, these, um, these teas, so offering them a little bit before you go or as you're, as you're going along or you know, when you're doing your breaks or at the end, uh, if they select it, then that's fine. That's going to be safe. And then for me, the biggest one is the Tellington Touch training because uh, it kind of underpins everything I do. Um, now, when I was training Mr. P in the car, I actually used a little bit of everything. You know, my main thing that I used with him was Tellington Touch, but I obviously did lots of the wall based training. I did oils with him. He's had homeopathy. You know, he's had some acupressure. I always use uh, flower remedies with new dogs in my house so I mixed everything up um, and I used them together now some of these you can't use them um, at the same time so for example I wouldn't suggest using oils and homeopathy together because the oils will counteract the homeopathy uh, but with the Tellington Touch you can use the, that with any of the the other holistic or um, all these these um, options and it will be completely safe so let's talk about what the kind of things that we can do um, and we're not just talking about motion sickness now we're talking about you know the dogs just not being happy in the car either so hopefully by now you've you've had a health check health checks are really really important because so many issues can start from pain and if we don't rule that out um, I think we're doing our dogs an injustice really so just make sure you get them down the vets get them thoroughly checked out I would definitely then look at your holistic remedies and you can get a referral to a holistic vet who can give you, um, you know, different alternatives to your mainstream vets uh, and often have some really good ideas as well. I'd also suggest taking a massive break from traveling in a car at all uh, and then use this time to do really good preparation, whether that's confidence building or um, starting your holistic remedies, all these things. So one to two weeks definitely of not going anywhere near the car. Uh, can be really, really useful. If, for example, your dog has a bad association with a car, say, for example, you know, they, they've only gone somewhere that is scary um, or, you know, whatever it is going on in their heads, just changing that association can be really good. So, for example, dogs that get overly excited in the car, you can go and do calm things with them, sit in there and read a book. Uh, pop them in the car with a Kong, um, sit in there and do some tea touch with them, do anything that isn't bouncing around and being all excited because you're just about to go to the to the, to the park to see all their best friends and it's going to be the best thing ever. Uh, go for really boring journeys and come home, you know, just change that association so they don't start to kind of always associate the car being something really exciting. 
and it's the same for dogs who find it really scary just do lovely stuff fun games around the car you know lots of feeding them lots of treats letting them jump in and out this kind of stuff look at that position in the car and look at safety obviously as well we don't want dogs obviously leaping into the front with you if you do pop them in the back seat so we need to make sure it's safe but look at that position as we as we talked about before get into some t-touch training and again we're going to talk about that more in a minute get into those reward based trainings as well do some really good fun stuff use food rewards use games toys whatever it is that motivates your dog because not all dogs will be motivated by food some of them will just be motivated just by you having a really good time with them and praising them and fussing them so for those of you who don't know anything about Tellington Touch um, we describe it as a forward-thinking approach to training handling and rehabilitation uh, lots of people call it a therapy it's not it is a training method uh, it just will not look like anything that you've ever seen before because we use a lot of different um, things like body work and uh, bits of equipment and uh, obstacles that we ask the dogs to walk through, for example. So how does it work? Because of the body work that we do, so this is where we're touching the skin of the dog, so we're moving them in non-habitual ways. So non-habitual movement is really good for enhancing and shortening the time it takes to learn something new. We know that when we're touching the dogs, we use a pressured touch, and pressured touch is very calming and comforting. So it's a really good way of just helping them feel better anyway. It's like you, if you're upset and someone gives you a hug, you feel much, much better. We also know when we're doing these non-habitual movements through the body, and these are movements like circles, lifts, and strokes, and we're only moving the skin around, so it's really easy to learn and very safe for you to do. When we move their skin around in, in these certain ways, we have uh, lots of releases of neurotransmitters. So that by that, I mean things like serotonin and dopamine and oxytocin, which are all those lovely endorphins that make us feel happier, more bonded, more secure, more confident, have massive, massive effects to help us to be calm. And it, it will kick into the, to the um, part of the brain that's going to deal with us being calm and looking at rest and digest and feed and breed rather than the sympathetic nervous system which is all about fight and flight so we want to kick in the parasympathetic nervous system uh, and that's what we'll do by using the t-touch body work as well by doing that we're obviously going to keep them out of a, of a fear response and that means we can keep their brains thinking so we can ask them to come up with a different choice so instead of jumping around can we sit calmly in the car um, instead of whining can we be quiet in the car you know we give them different choices because their brains are still working their brains are still able to be rational and then they can make a choice or they can actually listen to the training that we're doing with them so that's a very very quick overview about how T-Touch works so the biggest thing to remember about T-Touch, and this is the thing that will really hopefully get you to understand how, um, how it's going to benefit with the dogs, is that posture affects behavior. So when your dog is out of balance physically, they're going to be mentally and emotionally out of balance as well. It's just like us. If we are injured um, and we start to kind of hold our bodies in a particular way and we overcompensate, it has, uh, and if we're in pain, it has a massive effect on how we deal with life in general we often become less tolerant of noise we are more guarded about people touching us we um, don't want to be social we you know we have all these sort of things that we don't want to do because we're, we're frightened it might hurt but also it's uncomfortable to us as well now sometimes with us and with with animals and especially with the dogs um, they get locked in sort of these postural patterns so for example if, if the dog has been really frightened about something they'll hold that in their bodies in what we call a tension pattern and we'll look at tension patterns and, and how you find them a little in a, a little couple of slides time so these this posture if we hold our bodies in a, a posture of fear all the time our body's going to constantly tell us to be fearful of stuff but thinking about this linking to the car when we were saying that a lot of dogs have issues through balance so if they are holding tension and they can't balance themselves um, then it's going to make them feel much worse in the car so so for example you've probably seen some puppies who um, just can't walk on on laminate floors they really really struggle so these are dogs who are going to really really struggle being in the car because they're unbalanced anyway and then you put them on a surface that isn't stationary and it's really difficult for them so you know that postural um, imbalance could turn up because there's a, a health problem or because they're just generally out of balance or for lots of different reasons but if they're out of balance like I say posturally it's going to affect how they behave behaviorally 
So when we do the T-touch with them, we can really shift an animal from a state of arousal or fear back to a state of, of, of calm and focus. So that's really what I'm talking about with the brains affected. So we can keep that brain thinking, we can keep them out of the fight, flight, freeze, fall arounds, you know, all those fear responses that dogs will have when they're anxious um, and fearful of something, or they're just overly stimulated because there's like really exciting things going past the window and they just can't listen. So we can help them just to start to calm down, to listen to you, to be able to change that response. Now these tension patterns will show up in um, ways like uh, the body will feel uh, hot in some areas or cold in some areas or the skin might feel really tight and gritty or there may be a difference in the hair like there's a certain swirl in the coat or a different texture or feel to it or some areas might be dandruff for example. So what we do with their, those tension patterns, they will be developed through, you know, a trauma of like a fearful situation, whether they've had really bad, you know, training experiences like, you know, shock collars or this, that and the other use on them. They might have had an injury, it could be the equipment, you know, it could be born like it. These tension patterns just will appear through the body and this is what we need to change for them to be able to be more balanced, more confident, more happy in all these situations. And of course when we're talking about T-Touch we're not just talking about car travel issues it can help with, it can help with multiple issues, especially those real emotional issues that we will see dogs have, noise phobia, um, fear of of other dogs, people, uh, separation anxieties, all these things can be helped with T-Touch. So we've got three elements to the work. One is body work. So like I said, this is moving the skin around in circles, lifts and strokes. So it's non-habitual movements, really good for just highlighting, bringing out those tension patterns and almost like setting the everything, that blueprint back to normal. We're going to release those tension patterns, put the dogs in a more confident posture and if they are in a more confident posture then they will feel more confident as well. So we're going to have all those lovely endorphin releases, we're going to have them feeling more stable anyway because they can use their bodies more efficiently, that's going to keep their brain more active as well, more able to listen and to be able to have act rather than react to a situation. So body work can be really useful, especially if we can use it before, during and after um, a car journey. Groundwork is another massive one that we use for dogs that are anxious in the car. And, and I remember Karen, my co-writer of the book, really talking about how she figured this out with one of her previous dogs because she started to do agility with one of her dogs. And she noticed as the dog became more balanced over the agility equipment, she became much better in the car. Now, groundwork in the T-touch sense isn't about just jumping over or going through obstacles very quickly. It's about slow, measured uh, movements. It's about stopping really often. Again, it's about the balance. So if their proprioception out, the proprioception is how they, they kind of figure out which part of the body is related to the other bit and how they all work together. So if we can get the dogs to walk over, through and on different surfaces or around cones, step over things, um, it can really help to just build up confidence, uh, help them to be balanced through the body, which then again will help them to be more confident in the car. So groundwork is a big thing. We, we call it groundwork or the confidence course because it can build confidence. You can use anything for groundwork. You've seen here in the picture, we've just put anything we can find. So we've got some garden poles, we've got some old car tires, we've got um, some matting that you might use in your tent. We've got um, a dog ramp that you would use for the car, you know, anything you can use um, for them just to have a sense of stepping over things, stepping on things, stepping around things. So it can be really powerful. And here's Archie, which is Karen's, uh, one of Karen's dogs. And uh, what we're doing here is teaching him to start and to teach him to use a ramp. So for a lot of dogs, if they can't get in the car because they're old or they're arthritic or they've had an injury, a hip dysplasia, whatever it is, we can't just expect the dogs to be able to walk up a ramp into a car. So we can just start to elevate it at one end, just gently and get them used to that. And then we can start to elevate it more and more and more until eventually we can get them quite happy and confident walking up and down it. And then we can start doing it to help them get in and out of the car. So what we're doing here is we're using the groundwork as a very practical way of helping the dogs to be able to work out and be confident in using this tool to get in and out of the car. And here's Mr. P, he's doing groundwork around my car. So as, as you uh, might remember me saying, he was not a good traveler when he came to us. He was um, probably under a year old here um, and limbs all over the place, was often very sick, quite vocal in the car as well. 
So we, I just wanted to again change that association for him and the car. So I started to do the groundwork around it. So he was in view of it, but there was no pressure to get in it. Um, and could help his balance, help him to remain calm before I then started to get anywhere near um, asking him to do anything in and about uh, the vehicle. Some of the things we can use that are really, really useful for traveling dogs, one is the body wrap, uh, seen here on the right, this is Angel, this is uh, Karen's other Whippet. Um, now, lots of you have probably heard of the Thunder shirt, they were developed from the T-Touch body wraps. Um, and Again, it's about comfort, security, but also the added benefit of body awareness. So how is Angel using her body? Can she be balanced through her body? If she can be more balanced, she can be more comfortable in the car. So body wraps, if safe to do so, obviously you have a dog that's whizzing around and it might slip or they might get caught up on it. Um, you wouldn't want to use them um, as you're traveling, but you could use it in preparation for getting in the car or while you're doing car tra training or use a thunder shirt instead. For dogs that are really vocal, they might do really well with a face wrap or a calming band. So this is a picture of Bertie on the left here with, um, you can see a little bit of elastic across his nose. We started to figure out the dogs were better in the car and less vocal when we were using, we used to use um, a lot of head collars on dogs. We, we don't en anymore. We've, we've got different methods now. But when we did use them, we noticed that they just carried them, just had them on the heads. They were a lot calmer. The vocalization decreased. So for dogs that are really barking in the car, get them used to a face wrap. Um, this is just a, a piece of elastic, but you can buy something like a calming band. Um, and they can be really useful for just bringing awareness to what's going on in that, um, that head of theirs. So often dogs will bark and they don't actually realize they're barking. It becomes so habitual. So this will again just say, do you know you're barking? And if they know what they do, then they've got the ability to change it. So it can be really helpful for calming that vocalization down, but also calming them down emotionally as well. It sits over those gums and lip, lips. It's a powerhouse that kind of links to our, our brains, the part of our brain that deals with emotions and learning. So again, it could be very calming. So what I would suggest when you're doing your travel training and you're having your break from doing um, actually anything near the car, spend that time doing T-Touch body work with the dogs. Use a body wrap. If you feel like a face wrap would be useful, start to introduce that. Start to do some groundwork, maybe not anywhere near the car. If they're that anxious about anything to do with cars, do it in your back garden, do it in your house. You know, It doesn't have to have a huge space to do it. Just start that preparation work so that when you start to get back into the car and around the car, you can introduce the work in that scenario. You can continue and doing the T-Touch work and they'll feel uh, much happier. They already know that work um, and the body will remember it and respond to it and calm them down a lot quicker than if you just went straight to the car and did some T-Touch work. So use it as prep time in your break. Once they are calmer, we can use the tools to actually start getting them to have that, po po that positive association around the car. So here you can just about see Mr. P's got his body wrap on, it melds into his body quite nicely, but you can see he's got his body wrap on under his harness. You can see in the background, we've got some of the body, that the ground works. So he's had a session of ground work. He's had some tea touches. He's got his body wrap on. So now what I've done is I've actually opened all of the doors in the car and had no pressure on him. He's got a, on a long line, so there's nothing around his neck. Um, the long line's very slack, so I'm not pressurizing him to go near the car. And he's just starting to reach into the car to take treats out. And that's what you'll find. You'll need to put them really, really, really close to, uh, initially so they can just take them and retreat. And then after a while, you'll be able to get them to go a little bit further, a little bit further. And for Mr. P, over several sessions, he got to the point where he was leaning so much that eventually he had to take a, take a step and he had to step into the, the, the boot and eventually he did jump up and we can see here, I think there's a series of him, so he did start to get a little bit more braver. We can see how loose, loose my lead is, there's no pressure, he can jump out at any time. Um, and I would often do this when I returned from a walk as well, he's chilled, he's relaxed, he's not needing to toilet, he's had a good time out and about, and we'd do two minutes before we went back in the house. And that was all I would do every day near the car. I'd do other work with him outside um, of that area in the house, for example, but just two minutes of training is all I needed. And it took very, very short amount of time for him to be jumping in the car, uh, probably less than a week, and he was doing it himself. 
Uh, and you can see he is just sniffing around for treats. Again, the leaves are really loose, so he can jump out any time. I'm standing in a position which means he can leave at any time he wants to. It has to be his choice. Um, I don't have the other doors open here, but I would suggest if your dog's really nervous, you have all of the doors open so that they've always got an escape route. And this is why a long line is really important. So if they want to go in and out again, um, you don't inadvertently pull them or yank them or, or drop the lead as well and panic them that way. So give them that sense of freedom. In between training, played loads of games with him. So the games around the car, um, you can chuck the toy in and out for him to retrieve and jump out again, whatever it is, but just don't put the pressure on too long. We know scientifically now that actually just a few minutes of training less than that probably about 90 seconds is probably your optimum amount of time before you give them a break and do something fun so when you're doing this training and it can be quite intense make sure it's very 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 short periods of time you know moments at a time then go away do something really really exciting fun calming something that takes the pressure off you can then maybe go back and do another 90 seconds but then come away again do something else um, the biggest mistake people make is they keep going and then we turn it into doing some flooding which is obviously not good it means we're pressurizing the dogs too much and they get shut down and they get overly anxious so little little moments of training so here he then decided that he can stay in the car and he can look about uh, still not looking completely happy he's still a little bit worried through that face but as you can see again he's got a clear view out um, and a clear option to jump whenever he was. He just started himself naturally to hang around in the back of the car a little bit more to the point where he started to lie down. And again, you can see he's not completely comfortable here, so which is why I've not progressed to closing doors or anything like that. And you could argue here that actually I'm blocking his um, exit from the car. He's a big enough dog that he could jump over me if he wanted to, or he can get away. I'm just there. I'm actually doing a bit of tea touch with him, just, just noticing that he's still a little bit tight, a little bit tense. Um, so I can use some food here if I wanted to, if he could still eat. Some dogs won't, so that's where the tea touch can be really useful. Or using your oils that you've been using in the house. Um, anything you've got to hand, putting all those modalities together, you know, using everything, body wrap, Tellington touch, you know your homeopathy whatever it is using that all to help him be successful I knew that my dog wouldn't want to travel in the boot but it was an easy way for me to start it was easier for him to start going in and out of the boot so then I progressed to letting him be able to see all the way through the car and again dropping treats right on the rim of the door here um, and then further in and further in and again having that lead long enough that he could go in and out the other side and this is, might be useful when you have somebody else with you so that you can actually use it as a game to jump through obviously you need to be careful about the area you do this if you've got a gated drive that's brilliant or somewhere quiet you can go just make sure though that it's safe uh, if they're on a long line they're not going to obviously run out into the traffic and here we go, he's managed to jump in. Uh, he's looking quite happy. He can get out the other door if he wants to. Uh, again, possibly looking a bit anxious because somebody else is taking a photo of him here. Uh, but he did choose to start lying down in the back of the car, spending some time there with me, having some tea touch, chilling out. But he was allowed to get out of the car whenever he wanted. So what I did is regress to just closing doors one at a time. Um, not even started the engine yet. Uh, but when I did start the engine, Again, we may have to go back a couple of stages. We may have to go back to him being able to have the, being able to get out of the car very quickly, being at me there to do some touch work with him, using the body wrap, using um, the calming remedies as well that might be useful that he liked and selected. Once he is completely comfortable, now some dogs really panic about the boot coming down. It's this huge scary thing whacking down towards them and it can be really traumatic for a lot of dogs. So really work on this, break this down for them, move it like centimeters at a time, keep letting it go back up again, moving it centimeters at a time, going back up, feeding the dog, giving them encouragement, letting them get out if they want to, really break it down. And in the book we've got a massive section on just training on how to close the back door because for some dogs it's a real issue so do be aware of that. So let's talk about um, some key success to success here. Uh, so your stage one that you're going to do, just make sure um, that by this point, hopefully we have detected the reason for the poor traveling, whether it's a health issue or a bad association or whatever it is. We've ruled out those, those health issues by a, a good vet check and we've taken a break. We've used those, that break to add in those confidence building exercises, using your remedies, starting your training. It may be that you start your training, you know, 
feet away from the car. Your dog can only just look at a car and start to heavy breathe to give you signals to say that they're unsure. And it will be at that point that you would start to do some of your T-touch work for a few minutes, then walk away from the car again. So it may not be that you can go straight to the car. And of course, once you've done all these stages that I've just shown you with Mr. P as well, you've got them really comfortable in the car, they've got to the point where they can lay down, um, that they are happy, that they might be able to eat or play with a toy with you in there. Uh, only at that stage should you start to be turning the engine off. And at that point, you may have to go back several stages with them in the training because their anxiety will shoot up again massively at that point because the engine's going. So not until they are absolutely comfortable in the car, with the engine going, with all the doors closed, in the position in the car that they enjoy, using all your remedies and all of your um, the techniques that we've been talking about, only then should you start to move the car at all. Don't rush this stage. If you get this stage right, the rest of it will be a breeze. Um, we had someone who messaged us in January, the book came out on January the 1st, uh, and by the end of January she said, I, I pre-ordered it, I got the book the day they came out, three weeks later my dog is um, absolutely bomb-proof in the car, from being a terrible traveller to really, really good. She's gone through all these stages, made sure she's done the preliminary work, and the next bit was really, really simple because the dog's already 100% improved in their anxiety levels. When you're in the car, and of course, when you're actually traveling, if it's safe to do so, if you've got someone else to drive for you and you can be strapped in next to your, your dog safely and properly, uh, properly uh, restrained, you can continue to do some T-touch work and things like ear work, which is simple slides of the ear, which is very good for lowering the respiratory rate and the heart rate, really good for motion sickness as well, so making them feel less nauseous. Um, simple touches like the zebra touch, which is a, a sort of a quite fast moving kind of stroking touch that kind of works down the body. One of the um, the clouded leopard touch, which is a circular touch, which is really good for building up confidence and it's good for balance. We can do all of these as we're going along. Or you can spend time before you set off if you've got nobody else to do it, doing a T-touch bodywork session with them in the house, doing a bit more in the car before you then start your journey. And um, you can stop at any time. Make sure when you start going off, first of all, that you can stop easily places. It's quiet places so that you can actually start to do um, some work again if they need it um, at any stage on your on your training. The springbok touches are more of a faster sort of jumpy touches. Think about an antelope jumping uh, around the, the body really quickly. It's very good for dogs that are really agitated, so it can really help them to calm down very quickly um, and start to listen to you. Works for some dogs, not for others. Sometimes it's the zebra one that will work. So sometimes it's a case of just finding the touch that works for you, but definitely if it's safe to do so, thunder shirt, body wraps, if they need the face wrap because of their vocal, put that in, do that as much as you can before traveling, but also, like I say, if you're traveling, if it's safe to do so. <clears throat> Your stage two, uh, this is where you can then start obviously moving about a bit more. Once they're really happy with that car engine noise, we can then start to just move just tiny little bits, a couple of feet at a time. And it may just be you only move a foot and then you stop and you turn the engine off and you go back in the house. It doesn't matter. Don't be tempted to go further. This is the biggest mistake that most people go. They go, oh, they were right around the block, so I went round to Tesco's. <laughs> no, don't do that. <laughs> or any other supermarket. Um, little and often. You know, if it seems to you like it's doing really, really well, your dog's doing really well, and you're going, wow, this is really, really working, that's the time to stop. Have a positive experience. Go home. Celebrate the fact that your dog's been happy for you going six foot down the road. You know, it do, doesn't matter. It, you're going to progress quicker if you do it slower, if you see what I mean. Start the trips that you do being really easy ones. So keep away from roundabouts. Uh, keep on quiet roads. Keep on to places where it's near home. So if your dog starts to panic and you think their anxiety level's gone up too much, you can stop, get them out of the car, and walk them home. It's no good going, oh, well, I'll just get home, because that's our human instinct to do that, and it would just possibly set you back a few weeks in your training. So don't be frightened. Just go somewhere near home, quiet roads, make sure you can get home whichever way you can. You can get someone to drive you perfect, but I know it's not always possible. It's really, really hard. So just make sure you put all that prep work in so that your dog's calm and relaxed and in balance before you start off.
just make sure you do like build up those destinations really slowly as well and again think about what your end destination wants to be if your dog's overexcited in the car you want to be a boring journey you might just go around the block and go to the shops if it's safe in with weather wise and leaving them in the car for a few minutes while you go in a shop uh, but come home again um, don't always go to the park to meet their friends and have a blast you know they need to discover that it's a boring thing to be in the car that it's a relaxing thing to be in the car that it's a different experience of course if you've got a nervous dog and they you know their best thing ever is to go and visit their their your, your aunt uh, Mabel uh, that's just a mile down the road go and visit my aunt Mabel and it's a great destination at the end you will have good days you will have bad days but don't despair about that because what you should start to see is the good days start to progress and become more and more often and that you can start to get a little bit further and a little bit further every time you do it but what definitely I would suggest is that don't feel like you're on your own um, there are plenty of professionals out there whether it's a Tellington touch practitioner whether it's a raw based trainer you know a, a holistic vet a practitioner that that um, does the essential oils um, whatever it is get professional help you know as long as it's the right help um, it can be really really brilliant for you you can have two pairs of hands two pairs of eyes uh, and have all the experience of that professional as well that's going to really help you but above all be really laid back about it there's no point getting upset about it it's not your dog's fault um, I know it can be very um, annoying upsetting not very nice traveling in a car that a dog is either sick in or is bouncing around in you know we have to think about safety and all of that stuff but there's no point in us getting wound up about it it you know it will happen put the work in and you know unless there's a major health problem that you haven't uh, addressed I can I can pretty much guarantee that you will have a dog that is better in the car Mr P now travels really nicely um, he may be a little bit vocal but we can deal with that um, by putting some prep work in using his thunder shirt and etc etc in the car and sometimes I do go back to basics with him but you know he's gone from not being able to go five minutes down the road um, the other day he did a 180 mile round trip with me and was an angel so you know you can get there you just need to follow those steps and remember to use lots of things together not things singly if you want to know more about T-Touch um, and you want to find your local T-Touch practitioner, uh, ttouchtteam.co.uk is our UK site. Uh, if you guys are anywhere else, um, our international site is ttouch.com. Or if you're in a different country, because there may be people from Europe and, and other places, um, just go and stick Tellington Touch and your country's name in a search engine and you'll come up with, uh, hopefully, with someone um, in your country or the, on the or the guild office for your country um, just having one or two sessions or attending a workshop can really really give you enough information to go to safely work with your dog and can be really really useful the um, help books um, like I say uh, at Lisa said we're writing lots of them we're at the moment we're writing one about dogs trashing the garden the working title is help my dogs trashing the garden um, but we have the, the help my dogs get a fireworks uh, and obviously the car book as well and there'll be more and more coming out all the time they're all available on Amazon in Kindle form and paperback we've discovered we were only going to do them as, as Kindle we discovered people love the paperback still so they are in paperback as well and we keep them um, as cheap as we can um, it's only about one subject so again you don't have to buy a book that gives you lots of information you don't need it's every single thing that Karen and I know all the people we know who also deal with these issues and it, we stick it all in one book so you've got everything you need in one place it's a one-stop shop uh, this is the social media stuff for the book so the, the website bit long-winded Tony Shelbourne and Karen Bush at jimdo.com um, but uh, we stick everything obviously on our Facebook page which is a little bit easier to remember it's K9 ebooks by Tony Shelbourne and Karen Bush and we'll stick all the information about what books are coming up um, on there and again if you go onto Amazon just pick in, stick in any, either of our names if you can't remember the title of the books and it will come up with the books that we've written you'll be able to find it really easily uh, my stuff if anyone wants to um, talk to me afterwards if you've got questions about your dogs um, my website is tonyshelbourne.co.uk uh, my work Facebook page is the truth about walls and dogs which is my the name of my first book but I use that now as my work page so everything I, I stick on there 
you know, links to scientific papers, events that I'm doing, this, that and the other. Um, happy to link up with anyone on my personal page as well. I'm the only Tony Shelbourne out there. Um, you just have to put up with all of the, the funny things that my um, fiancé puts up there, but he is quite funny. Um, and then the Twitter, I'm not on there very often because who can say anything in 140 characters? Not me. Um, but uh, there is a little bit of presence there if you prefer Twitter. So thank you for listening. I hope it's been really useful. Um, I say I've had to whiz through, you know, condense 130 pages um, into an hour. So we probably have only skimmed the surface of everything. I say everything in the book is much more detailed. Um, but it is something that if you work through the stages, uh, we know it works because it's worked for Mr. P, it's worked for Lisa's dogs in the past, and we're getting feedback from people who've used the program and it's worked for them as well. So um, I hope you've enjoyed it. If you have any questions, um, I'm happy to answer some now and I'll hand back to Lisa. Great, thank you very much, Tony. That was really, really useful and very interesting. Usually we've got lots of questions by this time. Um, so we've, we haven't really got any. We've got lovely feedback from Colin, who says, um, this was a great webinar, really enjoyed it. I'll be looking to buy the book. Ah, oh, yes, there's a question from, can't see who it is, the, Hannah. Um, do thunder shirts tend to be more or less effective than body wraps for anxiety or overexcitement? Or is it really dependent on the individual dog? Thank you. Ah, so good question. So what we found is that just some dogs prefer the body wrap and some dogs prefer the thunder shirt. Um, neither one is better or worse than the other. Um, it's just what they prefer. Uh, obviously, sometimes if it's a dog that bounces around a lot, it's possibly safer to use a thunder shirt if they're happy in a thunder shirt. Um, the body wrap, I think personally, is going to give them more body awareness if it is an issue of balance. Um, and also, obviously, the body wrap on a hotter day might be a little easier in the car. But the thing to remember about car is, is the safety thing. If they're bouncing around a lot or you can't see them, you know, if it slips, they get caught up on it, it can be a little bit of a safety issue. So in that point, the thunder shirts may be better. But what you can do when you're training in and around the car is use both. So you use a body wrap one day and a thunder shirt the next if you're happy, if your dog's happy in both, because it will give the nervous system different information on different days. So it's a bit like when we put new shoes on, it makes us walk differently. And then we kind of get used to it. And then we put different shoes on again, it makes us walk differently again. So changing it for the nervous system by using wraps one day, thunder shirt the next day, t-shirt the next day can be really, really useful for that. But yeah, it's, sometimes it's individual choice of the dog. Or sometimes even the owner. Great. Thanks, Tony. Mayor says, thanks, Tony. Great webinar. Really enjoyed it. Uh, Franklin says, really enjoyed it, rather. So there's only a tiny, tiny little box showing up where the questions are. Um, Maddie says, thanks, Tony. I purchased your book because it will be really helpful for my clients. Uh, Maya says, hi, is it depending upon size? My dog is a miniature, um, so I wonder if the rat might be better. Um, the Thunder Shirt does come in lots of different sizes. Um, it's a case of measuring them, and, and online you'll be able to find out um, you know, the appropriate size and whether it would fit. Uh, there's also some really lovely doggy t-shirts out there. So, you know, the Thunder Shirt is the thing that everyone is most familiar with now, but it's not the only um, product out there. So, you know, there's there's the the calming coats from the American um, Kennel Club, there's the Equifleece t-shirts that are really lovely. So and, and if they can't find anything, a baby grow. You know, get a little tiny human baby grow put it on the wrong way around so the the bit that would be normally at the back of the head is under the dog's chin and obviously you want one that if it's a boy doesn't cover up any essential bits but uh, baby growth can be really really useful and they'll have the same effect before thunder shirts were out um, in t-touch we just used to use human t-shirts because that's um, all we had and it wasn't until these companies started to see us use these things that they developed something that looked a little bit more acceptable than your dog wandering around in a Britney t-shirt or you know some weird design like that great ellen says thank you this is underlined that i need to work slowly uh underlined hang on that i need to work slowly um very hard to read this and keep going 
Yes. Uh, <laughs> it is slowness is the key, isn't it? Just taking it slowly. Um, Deborah yeah. said, dogs be in a crate or harness, what's the safest way to have them in a car? Well, actually, unless it's a crash-tested harness or a crash-tested crate, neither of them are actually at, tested at high speeds and probably will fail. That's the thing. It's it's quite a scary thing to say, but you know, dogs even in crates, in the the impact, if it's not secured down, it will get thrown around and the gates can open, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, I think sometimes it's your dog's choice, or it's paying the money to get whatever it is that has actually been tested in a crash situation which actually when you look at it isn't that many products mm. Lainey says hi Tony Harry my collie boy has never had issues car sharing um, has begun shaking and reluctant to share the space with my newer dog Jasmine any tips um, I'd say if it's an, a sudden uh, onset and it isn't just because of the new dog, um, then a vet check, definitely. Is there something going on? Or is there his position changed in the car because of the new dog? Um, is the new dog upsetting him for whatever reason? You know, are they jumping around being vocal, whatever? We need to, you kind of need to do that detective reason of why is it happening but definitely will by trying some of the t-touch stuff out see if that will settle down but I will always say when it's a sudden change the best thing to do is always vet check first because it may be that there's you know depending on the age of the dog there may be a little bit of arthritis starting or you know whatever it might be digestive upsets all of those kind of health issues that we listed and there are many many more um, we need to rule those out first but I would definitely definitely start to really analyze when it happened what the other dog's doing you know is is he not so happy with the close proximity of the new dog is their relationship maybe not as bonded as much as you think they are when they're in a bigger space so of course we've limited the space he can't get away from the other dog you know but don't look at just the obvious stuff look at all the other things as well just to make sure that you've covered all bases great um, June says, great webinar, thanks Tony. Um, and Ali says, oh hold up, lost, lost something. All of a sudden there's, there's a few things in there. Ah, oh, here we are. Um, thank you Tony, really informative and interesting. We've been taking Barch Remedies um, and had a rest. So now we'll get on with the tea touch. Um, cool. Great. And then Emma says, when would this be available to watch again? I thought it started at 8 p.m. for some reason, Egypt. So caught the last one. <laughs> <laughs> well, <I'll>, um, <laughs> never mind, Emma. I'll, I'll, uh, we've recorded it. I'm still recording. So I'll upload it um, and create a private link for it and then send that out. So, so you should be able to watch it. I'm hoping to get that done tonight. If not, you'll get it tomorrow, so you won't have to wait long. Um, Mayor says, tea touch rocks. <laughs> it certainly <Yay>. does. <laughs> um, somebody else, Sandra, says, I shall start working with Millie tomorrow. Though I expect we'll take some time. She's been like this for almost four years. Oh, bless. Um, oh. Yeah. I'm sure I'll message you as I go along, as the other half going into hospital tomorrow, the coming week may be difficult, I hope that will be okay. Oh, Sandra, I'm glad you managed to to to, to come, I know we, we chatted on Messenger earlier, so um, it's lovely to see you here. Brilliant. Um, someone else, oh, Le Levi, says, hi Tony, thanks for some very useful information. I'm looking forward to improving some unwanted behaviour with one of my dogs who I know associates car trips with long walks. Um, Katie says, yeah. thank you very, very interesting. Yeah, you often get the opposite problem, don't you, where they, if you take them out to the vets quite often in the car, then they can get a very negative association yeah. of everything they go in the car. They think they're going to the vets, so you have to do lots of um, creating a positive associations then, as, as, as you've been saying, Tony, this evening. Yeah. And luckily, you know, my vets were in walking distance. So, you know, as my boy was um, travel training, I, d I just walked him to the vets. 
<laughs> so that to cut that one out altogether. I was like, no, I'm not doing that. So oh, let's walk. <laughs> oh, lovely. Katie says, thank you very much. Very interesting. Emma says, thank you. Um, and June says, how is Mr. P secured in this photo? I'm looking to move one dog to back seat and all my others just got tied up in their lead on a harness clip. It's a really difficult one if they're moving around a lot. And I think, you know, sometimes we have to, for a while, what I did was actually put a car grate um, behind my seat. So it was actually behind a, a dog grate between the back my the back of the passenger and the driving seat and, and where he is on the back seat and that's how I secured him uh, but you could see uh, I don't know if you saw in the picture of the, my back seat I had one of those um, the the things that clip into the car seat um, and then clip onto the back of his harness um, and but I had to make sure we didn't use it until he'd settled because obviously he moves around because he's so big uh, you know getting one that's tall enough for him and, and like you say you don't they don't get caught up in it can be really difficult so you know I have to say for him sometimes he's he's just on the back seat he's not secured uh, but he doesn't jump around in the car so it's safe and 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 it is actually not against the law to do that although they advise you in the highway code that you should have them um, restrained um, or under control so he's under control um, but if we're going anywhere where I can't stop really really easily um, then he's he's on the back seat which probably isn't the, the best thing, but like I say, you know, sometimes there's dogs just aren't happy being restrained in any way or it's not safe for them to do so. So in that case, you may have to go to a crate if you want to make sure that they are completely safe. Ooh. Great. Yeah, settle what's that, June says. <laughs> I <laughs> use like, um, for Sky. He sometimes, because I'm always in the back seat with him when we travel, he's sometimes just loose because he's very good. He just lies down. But yeah. so it's going to be a longer journey. Then I'll use um, a harness clip, you know, some little clip that goes from his harness onto the seatbelt. Um, yeah. That really helps. To it just means that if it's you know you know that they're not going to come to any harm. Mm. Deborah says um, I have a strap that you plug into the seatbelt and attach to the harness. Um, yeah, that's what I had to pay. Yeah. Got, um, but the dog stood up and pressed the red release button and got loose. Good grief. That was oh, clever. No. Oh. <laughs> Oops. That's like oh. a one in a thousand chance, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, mean, I think there's, you know, that none of them are perfect. Whatever you use in the car, like I say, unless it's, you know, your dog are really happy in the car and you're in one of those really, really crash tested crates, which they actually can't see out of very well. Um, but your dog has to be really comfortable and, and confident to be in one of those and not be able to see you. So I don't think there is a really good, safe answer for dogs being restrained in the car. Not yet, not that I've seen. Um, you know, it's either that or it's a very, very expensive, like I say, harness that's been crash tested. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, it's it's a difficult choice. It really is. And of course, if you're traveling with your dog abroad, different countries have different laws. So you have to be aware of that as well. So although the highway code in this country, you know, it's 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 a divisible, but not it's not illegal not to have them restrained as in in a crate or, you know, in a harness. In other countries, it is against the law. So you do have to be careful about that. Find out the law in your country. Great. Let me just check. I don't think there's any left. Oops. Nope. Okay. Well, wow. thank you very much, um, everybody, for coming along. And huge thanks, Tony, for a really interesting and useful presentation. Um, you will be able to access it. Um, those of you who are members of ISCP and Into Dogs, I'll be able to share the private link on the Facebook groups, but it will also I think go out in the newsletter um, and those of you who aren't members I'll send you an email with the link in so that you can access the private link um, oh here we go June's just asked another question can we have the garden book very soon please <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, I'm trying to move house and get married in the next couple of months, so it's a little bit slow going. So we'll try and get it out, hopefully, in the middle of the year. <laughs> it's on its way, I promise. 
And uh, Mayor says thank you. Yeah, it's, it's June's eight months old GSD. He's doing the digging. He's extremely well, cool. The, um, the front cover will be a picture of Mr P digging a hole in our garden, so I know exactly where she's coming from. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and you've, wit you've witnessed the um, pits that Charlie, my feral dog, used to dig as well. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, that's fabulous. Well, thank you everybody for coming. Um, I will let you all go now because we've gone quite over time, so I'll stop recording. And um, 